Breathe, just breathe. Breathe, just breathe. Breathe, just breathe. And let your tenderness be held. Ana Elda Refa Ana La Shabbat Shalom. Chodesh Tov. Happy new month of Iyar. Our sages offer that the month of e the Hebrew letters that spell out Iyar, Aleph Yud Yud Resh, or an acronym for the phrase, Ani Adonai Ofecha, I, God, am your healer. Right after crossing the sea, as words to the people of Israel, God refers to God's self as a healer. I start my words for you this morning on the 40th anniversary of my bat mitzvah, among many other things that we're commemorating and celebrating, because today I want to honor the legacy from which I come a long line of healers. There was my Zeta, Chaim Walensky, Zichron Alivracha, who was a country doctor initially in London, Ontario, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, whose patients often said that they just going to see him was what made them feel better. Each of his four children became either physicians or therapists or both, three, both. My parents, Doctors Burl and Avinam Chernik were trailblazers in the field of marriage and sex therapy, and my father was an OBGYN. And both my sisters, Doctors Elisheva, Dr. Elisheva and Yonina Chernik, uh, I could go on, they are, but they are both healthcare practitioners with a multitude of modalities for offering comfort and healing. Although my work seems like it's a different path, I, I don't think so. At the center of my work is the kavana, the intention to bring comfort where there's pain, heart opening where there's constriction, and connection where there's isolation. So all of the people I mentioned were present on April 16th, 1983 at Orshalom Synagogue in London, Ontario, including my cousin Ari Lesk, and we think possibly Aaron Rotenberg's grandparents, um, and many people who are watching online. The shul was packed. When I told him I was nervous, the rabbi, Howard Hoffman, said to make sure to take all the faces in before I started. <laughs> and I did, and I saw a sea of faces, and I remember them, and they include all the people I mentioned, but also, of course, my bubby and her mother, Bubba Minja, and my safta, my father's father, um, and, and many, great aunts and uncles and aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. But also I remember the face of my Sefta Sarah, who at the time was dying of breast cancer. I learned to be who I am, both from being with skilled healers and also by being with illness and those who are ill. So we went to visit Sub and Sefta the December, so my bat mitzvah was April, and in December we went to see them where they lived in Tel Aviv. Well, we went to the beach, but they lived in Tel Aviv. Uh, it was December for us, right? So, and ju just like a little sidebar, my grandparents um, grew up in Winnipeg, but there were so many Jews at their high school that they never met there. They met in Tel Aviv, they married there, they had Avinoam and my Auntie Lily, and they came back during the war. And when I was five, they moved back to Israel. Traveling to visit them was a yearly adventure that filled my childhood with an immense richness. There was touring, there was seeing all the new archaeological finds, floating in the Red Sea, climbing Masada, crawling through the tunnels under the wall. There were also two caravan trips to the Sinai Desert when I was three and five years old. My parents are like super, super bold. Uh, they took three little kids to the Sinai Desert at, that, at those ages. And then there were also holidays with Saban Safta, time in Eilat, and warmer spots where we could just spend time together playing at the beach. And of course, visits to their dira, their apartment in Ganei Hala, 
where I can still smell the oranges and lemons from the nearby citrus grove. My Safta was a fountain of love, full of hugs and attention. She was also a feminist and an environmentalist long before it was hip. Seeing both she and my Saba was something that we all looked forward to very much. So because of the effects of the chemo, Safta wasn't able to be in the sun for long, so we left the beach together to go back to her room to rest. She regularly needed to clear the phlegm from her throat, turning her head and spitting into a tiny little paper cup. I lay to her right side, cuddled in, and she turned to me and asked, do you know that I'm dying? It's one of the most vivid moments of my whole life. She brought me in, naming the truth of the moment so I could be with her in the tra that truth. And as heartbreaking as that experience was, it modeled for me how connection and intimacy can come from with naming, acceptance, and acknowledgement. Today's Torah portion, my bar mitzvah portion, there, it's a double, double header, beautifully illustrates this, that very lesson, calling on us to approach illness and healing not as individuals, but as a community. So in Parsha Tazriya Mitzvah, we read about people with various ailments. You, you read it, you, you saw it, you got the gist. Various ailments, sources of suffering, pain, specifically illness of, uh, afflictions of the skin, tzara'at, that require separating people from the community. The ailments described cause the affected person to be in a state of ritual impurity, to ma, and they are required to go outside the camp. Now you can imagine at the age of 11, this was not easy material, and I reacted to these portions with real distress about the exclusion and isolation of the person who was deemed impure. That a sick person might be ostracized was very painful to me, as it is now. There's, in a, mo there's a moment in Tazria though, that I find quite striking, and 40 years later, I want to read Torah with a fresh lens. One who is afflicted with sara'at must walk around saying, Tameh, Tameh, Le Leviticus 13.45. They call out, impure, impure, so everyone can hear. Then they are removed the, from the community to outside the camp until they've healed, followed by an extensive purification ceremony to formalize the healing. Naming the illness would necessitate turning towards the truth of the moment, making space for the suffering to be felt. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. That it can be difficult to acknowledge that something is wrong, really to the point of denial. Instead of taking care of ourselves as needed, we, as my friend Sarah Hurwitz says, knuckle our way through. So the person who is ill calls out Tameh, and my question, another question is, what happens for those in the community who hear the call? How do we turn to those who are ill with illnesses we can see, but also with those we can't see? We can pray like we did today so beautifully when Yaakov read all those names and the space was filled with love. This is modeled in our Torah and throughout our tefillah, throughout our prayers, like, I, like we sang at the beginning, Anna Elna Refana La, please heal her, Moshe's words about his sister when she gets, is stricken with sa'at, the skin affliction. In the Talmud, in Talmud Bavli, Sota 32b, 3, it is taught, the person shall call out, impure, impure, they must inform the public of their pain, and the public will pray for them. Literally, they will ask for mercy for them. The purpose of the afflicted person calling out here is not to warn others to stay away, but rather to draw them near, at least emotionally, to implore others to pray for them. It is an invitation to respond compassionately with a sick person and to take action, not to run the other way. Rabbi Eli Confer writes, the act of praying for others and not just ourselves is a redemptive act. And what of the role of the high priest? Not exactly rofeh, 
but, but our high priest, what's, what's that role? This is the person who must go out to the camp. They leave their space and they have to go out of the camp to see the afflicted person returning again and again, attending to their very detailed purification process. They're more than a diagnostician, more than someone with a cure, a sacred presence, and as such an essential part of the healing process. I see in the Parsha an attempt to bring our attention to moments of incredible kedusha, of holiness, illness, and dying. If approached with attentive care and loving community, these are deeply holy times. How is it that in life's most messy moments, messiness of the body and messiness of emotion, might the Torah remind us that these are in fact times of tremendous holiness? But it's how we attend to them that raises up the kedusha, the holiness that's inherent in them. My father is in palliative care at home. My mother is with him and they are watching now, which is why I am weepy and grateful. Only two weeks ago, you wait, we might remember, it was Pesach, just two weeks ago. Normally my family, like many of yours, would be gathered around my parents' dining room table, dressed up, prepared for the formality of a full evening of ritual and song. This year, the Seder was very different. We gathered, my sisters, their partners, the grandchildren and grand dogs, all of us in my parents' room. We each took a seat on the floor, Above us were my parents, my mom lying beside my dad on the propped up beds, <clears throat> Haggadah in hand. He looked disoriented and distressed as we filed in en masse into his room. My dad is not able to call out his need, but we hear his need nonetheless. And we don't turn away, but we organize ourselves, our little family community, so that we can bring the rituals to him lighting nerot, the festival candles, singing kiddush with the blessing over the wine, and carrying out the Pesach rituals, fulfilling the mitzvah, the commandment of telling the story of the Exodus. We gather around him, drawing nearly karev. And although the care is ostensibly for him, we are made stronger by this act of loving. Indeed, we are made stronger. By the end of the Seder, his face shows more relaxation, and he made some the sounds of the singing. We became holy community, choosing to turn towards that which is different, difficult, painful, towards that which we may not understand, a mystery even for those with formal training in diagnosis and cure. We are all the priests now, with the responsibility of bringing presence and care. We are all healers, made in the image of the one that refers to themselves as healer. And we are all in need of healing. All part of a beautiful, yet broken world. Can we sit together and name what is happening so no one has to suffer in silence, in isolation? Can we slow down and acknowledge when we ourselves aren't well when we need help? Can we pray? for healing for those in need. And when healing is what is and not what is to be, can we pray for ease from suffering and presence, sacred presence, so no one feels alone? My bat mitzvah took place 35 years after the founding of the State of Israel and 48 years after my father, Avinoam ben Sion, whose 88th birthday is today, happy birthday, Ava, was born in Tel Aviv. Israel is woven through my entire life story and that of my family. <clears throat> and as we prepare to mark the 75th anniversary of the founding of the state, I'm grateful for the beautiful and meaningful ways Israel has been part of our lives. And I pray deeply that there will be healing for Israel too in the workings of democracy so that there can be continued thriving. I'll finish the way I began our tefillot, muda ani, with gratitude. First to my mom, who ran, over, run, ran through my Torah reading with me, who is next to my dad being the dugma, 
the example of holy caregiving. And to both my parents, Beryl and Noam, who blessed me on the day of my birth and my bat mitzvah and each day since for offering me just what I needed to form a strong Jewish identity, the foundation for a lifelong love of Jewish culture, ritual, learning, practice, and people. And I'd like to thank my chevrotot, at least two of whom are in this room, uh, and some who are not even in this country, uh, who helped me prepare my learning for today. It takes a village to write a drush, or at least for me to write a drush. And to all my teachers who have enabled me to reach this day with wisdom, knowledge, skill, and a deep and wide joy for being Jewish. And gratitude to each of you, my family, my chosen family, and friends, joining from far and wide, those who were there and those who are, this is the first, first bat mitzvah of mine, um, and to you, my very dear new Beth Sedek congregational family, of which I'm proud and thrilled to be part of. Let's end by singing together. Breathe, just breathe, and let your tenderness be held. Breathe, just breathe, and let your tenderness be held.